Okay, everybody else had props with them, you know? So I thought I should have my own, which is why I got the lectern up. And here I am. Uh, thank you very much to Shrishti for that introduction. Thank you to Dr. Banerjee for the invitation to be here. I really don't know what I'm doing here. Um, the stories that I've heard so far have been just incredible, and I think I can sum up my life in one line. The buck stops here. So I'm the final speaker, and I would like to enlist all of you in taking a moment to put your hands together and give that lineup of amazing speakers a round of applause. I think they were the bravest stories that came out here tonight, uh, completely gender neutral. Um, my struggles seem minuscule, and I'm really humbled to be standing here to be counted among the spark talkers. So I'll begin. I'm a little long, but I think I've, you've all indulged the others uh, enough, and I will not stand for too long between you and dinner. So, good evening. This is All India Radio. The news, read by. Three short sentences that I heard as a child and inspired me to pursue a career in journalism. Through it all was the blessing of sound. Not just any sound, but the sound of my voice. That I'm hoping that some of you would have heard on radio, on television, on the telephone, on the first mobile service in India, Airtel, scores of documentaries, and many, many other things that I have lost count of. But the most exciting one of which is being the voice of the nation's metros. The credit of steering me into this arena goes to my father, who was particular about my speech and tried to get me into the best convent schools that he could, so, so that I could learn English and speak it as a native tongue. So elocution, debates, public speaking became things that I would enroll in and excel at. And I didn't have a tutor or private lessons, but he made sure that I tuned into radio and television to hear the masters, and I had to learn to be a good listener first. I had to listen to the finer qualities the correct pronunciation, language, vocabulary, the style of rendition, and through it all, I had to make sure that I made my own style of rendition. With my father being in the armed forces, I shuttled across five cities and nine schools. And through it all, the one constant that I had was a boot camp dad, who made sure that I did my homework religiously. So I began in school with small events like reading the news in the assembly, being a part of the elocution, debating, and other declamation teams. And I learned very early that my voice on the microphone was powerful, was commanding, and was pleasant. And I took pride in being the one with the deep and non-feminine voice. It was when I was in my final years of school and we were posted back to Delhi and it helped that I was in the Air Force School, so it became the usual choice uh, to anchor small cultural programs for the Air Force. I won the Shankar's International Gold Medal for Best Speaker, and the then Minister for Information and Broadcasting, the late Vasan Sate, suggested that I should try and explore radio, and I did. And I began with Yuvavani, Delhi B, the General Overseas Service, and so on. Each small recording, interview, or program just made me learn more about uh, the art of broadcasting, about the importance of breathing without being heard, the art of modulation, the skill of editing, the magic of words, and of course, amplification, which all of you know today belongs to the Republic, uh, where a little goes a long way. So my journey began with the first public show for the Prime Minister, the late Indira Gandhi. I was invited to compare the Air Force Day Investiture Parade, and the chief then, 
Air Chief Marshal Latif, didn't know who I was. He had been told that the female voice that he had heard and liked that morning belonged to someone from the radio, and so I was summoned to meet him and the Prime Minister after the parade. He was completely shocked to see this pigtailed, bespectacled girl in a school uniform waiting to meet him. So he spoke to me for about half an hour to be convinced that it was me that he had heard, and then took me to meet the Prime Minister, Mrs. Gandhi, who was, of course, very kind and polite, largely because I was tongue-tied, completely in awe of the Iron Lady of India. Anyway, I went on to do Air Force Day parades for 10 chiefs and 25 years, and earned a commendation from the chief too. In 1982, I applied to All India Radio for news reading, got selected, and luckily for me, got put on immediately onto the Asian Games, uh, as they needed readers who were fast and correct with pronunciations, as the names that came up in the bulletins were real tongue twisters. So I had grown up listening to voices like Melville DeMello, Blotika Ratnam, Pamela Singh, Roshan Menon, Shorajit Sen, Sushil Javeri. And here I was, just 18, and reading with the greats. Those three sentences that I mentioned earlier ended now with the news read by Rini Simon. I think by now you've all figured out that very early in life, I knew what my calling was. Despite not having anyone in the family in the business, nor a mentor, or training schools, I was determined to make it. I think it takes courage to go out into a field that is as demanding as media is. More so because you're really on your own. No one takes you under their wing and guides you as in other fields. And being in the limelight can be taxing, can be really cruel. Audiences can be demanding, dismissive, and unforgiving, and you're really as good as your last show. I had chosen to join a medium that was all of this, and also chosen to remain independent and not join any system. It felt like a foolish choice to many who knew me, as I was not assured of a steady income and had no security net either. In my time, it was unusual to be an entrepreneur and people didn't see news reading or anchoring as a career. It was usually a pastime. My contemporaries all had other jobs and read news in their spare time. So it was tough. But I think being passionate about your craft drives you to excel in it. And my inner voice kept telling me to keep going despite the obstacles. Television happened two years later, after I had graduated, and that again was amazing. I got selected, and then I realized that usually you get put on the late night parliament news that nobody watched, and you could languish there for the rest of your life. I was extremely lucky because I was watched one night by a very influential uh, media critic called Amita Malik, who wrote about me in her Sunday column and asked that I be put immediately on the main bulletins. And the powers that be in Doordarshan listened to her. I was invited to read the following week after her Sunday article, and again, I stepped into a space that had been occupied by veterans. I was the youngest and the only one in my batch to be put on the nine o'clock main news. It was also two years since TV had gone color. We didn't have teleprompters, and many of us relied on photographic memory. News was given to us on cardboards with paper clipped on that runner boys would bring to us from the editor's desk to the studio that was really far off. There were no mobile phones either, and as news is always live, we could have not seen those pages that were being sent to us, and so had to edit as we read it and sound proper too. By now, I was juggling radio, television, live events, corporate gigs, voiceovers for films, hosting award shows, cultural festivals, and doing my post-graduation in journalism and history. 
And the fallout of this is what a lot of you suffer today from. I had time for nothing else. I was also the lone newsreader on radio during the 1984 carnage after Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. And as curfew was imposed in my city, I was living very close to the radio station and it gave me the chance to do a marathon three-day shift of news reading five-minute bulletin every half an hour. Being on primetime television gave me a unique opportunity to be a witness to many historical events and meet exceptional people and see world leaders up close. Covering or hosting prestigious events for presidents and prime ministers, be it the NAM Summit, the Satyagra uh, commemoration of the Satyagra movement, the India-Africa Summit, uh, just to name a few, or meeting leaders like Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, Pres President Clinton, President Barack Obama, Pandit Ravi Shankar, Hillary Clinton, Boris Becker, Aung San Suu Kyi, Yasser Arafat, the Dalai Lama, Mikhail Gorbachev, just to name a few, the list is really exhaustive. As much as it is exhilarating, it is humbling to know that I was in the same room speaking with them and listening to them. Courage really is one of the key factors for us to grow and be successful in our lives. Courage is doing what you're most afraid to do, and I believe there can be no courage unless you're scared. Well, it is the key to heart, and it allows us to be brave when there are tough choices to be made, or when you're being pulled in the many directions that is the new normal of our busy lives. Courage also helps us to stand tall and powerfully strong in who we are in the pursuit of a wholehearted life and its amazing potential. Courage gives you that space to live in the present moment, to plan for and to follow your greatest dreams and wishes. To me, heart and courage are the drivers to live out the fullest and most amazing life. I would like to add passion to this list, and I think um, Ratika has already added passion to that list. That is what drives you crazy, to make you do extraordinary things, to discover and to challenge yourself. Passion is and always should be the heart of courage. And sometimes courage is that little voice at the end of the day that says, I'll try again tomorrow. There have been innumerable, memorable occasions, and the most recent being last year when I hosted a three-day conference on gender equality at the United Nations in New York. That was a very proud moment for me. While there are several anecdotes that I could share with you, I've chosen just two to illustrate the overarching themes of Courage and Heart today. The first event made me realize the importance of my job. It was 1989. I was doing the Air Force Day Investiture Parade, a commentary from my booth, and we had reached the finale of the parade, which had a single Mirage jet with Wing Commander Joe Bakshi in it, heading past the front row of seats to climb vertically upwards, spinning as if its tail was the pivot of a top. He was going to do the most daring of all feats, going into a vertical Charlie. So the aircraft goes straight up like this, and he rolls his aircraft into a spin. Suddenly, I saw the legion of veteran aviators standing up, all shocked. Looking up, I saw that the aircraft was hurtling down, spinning into a roll, then a second, a third, and a fourth. That's when I realized that something was drastically wrong. Joe Bakshi disappeared among the trees to the right of a water tank. And as everyone waited for that blast, the nose appeared one fleeting moment over the trees. Then an explosion, a fireball, a black mushroom cloud of smoke, flying debris, and on the ground, panic. It all happened so fast that we were gobsmacked. 
I had veteran Air Force pilots inside the booth with me, and I'm still getting goosebumps thinking about this. I had veteran Air Force pilots inside the booth with me who had all frozen. I don't know how or why, but I grabbed the microphone and told people to calm down and move outside the seating area, make space for fire engines to pass through. Now, no one had told me to say any of that. I didn't even know what the procedure was in situations such as this. I just knew that I had to control the panicking crowds. So I tried to save the situation to the best of my ability, and I'm proud to say that no one was hurt in that stampede that followed. I got a commendation from the chief of air staff a couple of years later. The other incident is one that taught me to be alert and prepared for anything, whether it is a news bulletin or a live show. I was anchoring a program where President Shankar Dayal Sharma was the chief guest. Now, usually when you have a president attending a program, you begin, or rather it is mandatory to have the national anthem to begin the program, and you end with the national anthem. And we had the president's band there to play the anthem. So the program went off really well, and we reached the end. And I had made the announcement for people to stand for the national anthem. And when I didn't hear anything after I had made that announcement, I turned around to look to see where the band was supposed to be. And to my utter dismay, I didn't see them there. Now, the president was already on his feet. I had no one to ask what to do, so I began singing. Now, until that moment, I did not know if I could remember the words correctly, because I had last sung the anthem years ago in school. Well, sing I did, and no one realized that the band was missing. Now, if I hadn't, well, I also later discovered that the band had stepped out for tea and had not returned in time, but if I hadn't sung that anthem then, someone would have been fired. So as I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I will admit that courage, passion, and heart I love for what they bring to my life. And even today, I listen to that whisper, that little voice inside me that says, I will try again tomorrow. That is the end of the news. Thank you.